I prepared. Uh, after you hear it, you might say, you ought to go back to the old way of preaching, you know. But um, this past week, I spent uh, some time walking. All of you walk. Some of you walk some extra miles uh, to exercise and lose weight, and etc. And I try to walk two or three miles extra a day in that uh, way. And uh, so this past week, often when I walk, I, I, um, I pray. Sometimes I memorize. I memorize the book of James by just walking up and down around town. And uh, this past week or a few days, I, I was working on a message. Probably 80% of what I'm going to preach uh, this morning came from my studies as I walked. And you say, how can you do that? Well, in my pocket, I made a copy of the text. And uh, as I walked down the streets and around the block, I would uh, work on my message. I would read the scriptures and come up with various thoughts. Maybe I spent 20% of my time in the office. So literally, uh, this morning, as we think about walking in truth, the message would prepared by walking. And I'm going to do a lot of walking in front of you this morning so we can illustrate the importance of walking in truth. Uh, over here on my right, many of you are wondering, uh, did the baptistry leak again, or is the, uh, is the ch stage under construction? No, the cones I set out, uh, so I want us to be able to say, uh, when you walk in truth, uh, there is a path. Uh, it is narrow. When I walk uh, around town, I usually walk on a sidewalk, which is about this width, and uh, you walk straight for a long time. And walking in truth in the Word of God is walking within some boundaries. Uh, this past week, of course, we were all discouraged uh, concerning the uh, ruling of the Supreme Court on Friday. And uh, I was walking when my iPhone went off and I looked at it and it said the decision was five to four in favor of same-sex uh, marriage. And I was surprised. I think most of us probably assumed that that's what was going to happen in light of what we know about some of the judges. But uh, that night when I turned my television on Friday night and I began seeing celebration all across our country by people that I believe are sinners, uh, that way of life is not according to truth, I, I literally became despondent. I mean, I literally uh, almost lost it until I realized that no matter what decision is made out there, uh, we still have truth. And no matter what the world says, this is the way it ought to be and how they can call evil good and all of that. I'm encouraged to know that when I have the word of God, for the Bible says, thy word is truth. And if I study it, and if I work at it, and if I obey it and walk in it, then I'm okay, no matter what else. And God wants us to be walking in truth. We have the truth, and we need to walk in it. You know, when it comes to walking, we can read an article on walking and the kind of shoes you ought to wear and the clothing and make sure wherever you walk is safe. And we can read all about, all about walking and, and we could even teach a class on it and uh, we can memorize all the paper. But unless we actually get out there and walking, all we know is it's up here. A lot of times we know the truth. We know what the Bible says. We memorize it. We might even teach a class on it. But until you actually enter the path, and walk the line. Walking in truth is not just knowing truth, but it's practicing truth. It's living out the truth. And God wants us to stay. It's straight, it's narrow, because that's truth. But God has given us the word, and he wants us to stay within the lines and to walk in truth. And as we study this one book in the Bible, 3 John, uh, it's not the last book in the Bible, and it's not next to the last book in the Bible, but it's next to the next to the last book in the Bible. And if you're using a pew Bible, it's page 712, if that would help you. But we want to turn there and look at, um, look at that passage today and think about the importance of walking in truth. You know, over in Galatian, there are, Paul wrote, there are some um, products, results of walking in the flesh. If you walk in the flesh, not in the truth, but if you just do what you want to do, as we see evidence in our country, you, you, can, you can, you know, walk that way, but it produces 
immorality and adultery and lying and cheating, and the list goes on. Paul said, you walk in the flesh, that's, that's what the result's going to be. A little bit later on, he talks about walking in the Spirit. If you walk in the Spirit, it produces love, joy, peace, gentleness, long-suffering, self-control. Well, this morning, as we study John, the third John, he talks about if you walk in the truth, if you stay within the lines, if you listen to the Word of God, if you practice and live out your truth, it will produce some things in our lives. And we want to look at that this morning as we look at 3 John and as we study this book and we want to see the five, uh, five areas or five product that is produced. John is the, um, is the author. He calls himself the elder. He was one of the apostles. Uh, he was old at this time, maybe in the 90s. And uh, he was last of the apostles uh, that was living he was responsible to send some of the younger men to the various churches with, uh, with Bible lessons to teach them. See, the early church didn't have the comfort that we had today of having the complete Bible in front of us, and so the apostles were assigned to instruct these new churches and teach doctrine and show them how to live, and John was sending these to the churches, and uh, there were some churches that didn't want to receive these young men, in their church, and so John writes to this one church and commends them for what they were doing and then condemning them for not receiving one of the apostles. And so we learn about walking in truth. And John was the elder. Uh, it's interesting, the message this morning is given by the oldest pastor on staff. And tonight, uh, the message will be given by one of the younger men on staff. And John referred to himself as the elder. I'm just the eldest, not necessarily uh, the elder, but a title given to him. And he writes to a, a man by the name of Gaius. As we read Third John, there are four, four men that, uh, that we see in the book. John is the author, the apostle. He is referred to as the elder. He is doing the writing. He's writing on papyrus paper, a thin paper with a quill, dipped in homemade ink, we would call it, not the ink we would have today, but it was made out of charcoal and, and uh, the pith of a papyrus reed. And he was writing, and probably he wrote till the page was all filled. And then he got to the end, he said, I, 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 of, I, I really want more to write, but I'm not going to take another piece of paper, and when I come, I'll talk to you face to face. So John is writing a letter uh, to his friend called Gaius, and uh, he's going to send it to this church, and the content is to be read and, and obeyed as uh, he emphasized walking in truth. So there's the elder, John. There is Gaius. We don't know a whole lot about him. In the time of the Bible, the Roman name, there are about a dozen names, maybe 18 names, that were common names. So when a little boy was born in your family, you picked one of the 18 names. Gaius was one of them, very common name. And so we don't know a whole lot about this particular Gaius other than that he's mentioned here in 3 John. And then there's a man by the name of Diotrephes. Don't ever, don't ever name your kid Diotrephes. Diotrephes is a guy in this church that wanted to have the preeminence. He wanted to be boss. He wanted to be in control. And we'll study a little bit about him. And he wasn't walking in truth. John was walking in truth. Uh, Gaius was walking in truth. And then the third man that is mentioned here is a man by the name of Demetrius, another common name. We aren't sure if Demetrius was with John and carried the letter to the church or he was a member of that church, but we find that he had a, he, he had a good reputation because he was walking in truth. And uh, he was a godly person and he was commended for his walking in truth. Let me start reading, and maybe I'll read the whole chapter. It's not a chapter, the whole book uh, from 3 John. Maybe you want to follow along. I read it as we study it this morning. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health, just as your soul prospered. For I rejoice greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you, just as you walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Beloved, 
You do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers who have borne witness of your love before the church. If you send them forward on their journey, journey in a manner worthy of God, you will do well. Because they went forth for his name's sake, taking nothing for, from the Gentiles. We therefore ought to receive such that we may become fellow workers for the truth. I wrote to the church, but the Antiphes, who love to have the preeminence among them, did not receive us. Therefore, if I come, I would call to mind his deeds which he does, prating against us with malicious words and not content with that. He himself does not receive the brethren and forbid those who wish to, putting them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. He who does good is of God, but he who does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has a good testimony from all and from the truth itself, and we also bear witness, and you know that our testimony is true. I had many things to write, but I do not wish to write to you with pen and ink, but I hope to see you shortly, and we shall speak face to face. Peace be to you. Our friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. Now the theme is walking in truth. Uh, trying to illustrate that, how important it is that you as a believer, that we have the word of God, we have the truth, not just that we know it, but that we walk in truth. Sometimes people walk in truth, and sometimes uh, for a period of time, then after a while, they walk out of truth. And then uh, sometime later, they begin walking back in truth. God wants us to walk in truth all the time. Sometimes we get way far from the Lord, and sometimes we walk far from truth, even as a Christian. And sometimes we get into the dark and the shadow areas of life, and we begin having struggles and problems because we're not walking in truth. God wants us to walk within the lines. He wants us to know the Scripture. He wants us to study the Scripture, that we can walk in the truth, not just walk according to any way we want. God has given us the word, and there are certain parameters he wants us to live. We have the truth, not only in our minds, but we want to live it. Let me share with you five products that will result if you and I consistently, maybe not 100% of the time, but consistently, habitually, we walk in the truth. And the first result is, and it's minor, but it is there in verse... Uh, Verse 1, if we walk in truth, we will be, we will, it will produce healthiness. Now, I want to quick to say that uh, sometimes our health is all of God. In one sense, uh, the diseases we get, the cancer we get, is it's nothing to do with how godly we are or how ungodly we might be. It, it's just something that God has ordained. I understand that. But I also understand that I have a responsibility that in the Bible, within the, the Scripture, there are some principles that if we practice walking in them, it will help us to have not only a spiritual healthy life, but a physical healthy life. Now, the Bible says our bodies are the temple of God. If we take within our bodies uh, chemicals or abuse it in some way or live in moral and, and reckless the result will be some, some illnesses and some problems, but if we walk in truth and take care of our bodies and see what the Bible has to say, a lot of the commandments in the Old Testament was written just for the Jewish people to stay healthy, and God has given us at least some direction uh, that we ought to obey. And so John is saying to Gaius, I pray that you will be in good health as well as spiritual health. And I think there is some element that when you and I walk in truth, it produces a, a healthiness that maybe we wouldn't have otherwise when we get way off and walk in some other direction. It's minor, but I do bring it up. You know, walking in truth does produce a degree of healthiness, uh, of, of walk with the Lord. It, it prevents some of the problems of life uh, if we walk in truth, it does produce healthiness. But I want to go on to, um, to verse uh, uh, two, 3 and 4, where John says, For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth. He's talking to Gaius. 
of the truth that is in you. We mentioned that it's important to know the truth, to get it in our minds, but we also need to walk it out in our feet as we walk the truth, which is obeying the truth and living it out in our life. And the truth that is in you, just as you walk in truth, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. The second thing it produces as we think about walking in truth, it produces happiness. Not so much your happiness, uh, but the happiness of other people. John, we aren't sure if he really led Gaius to the Lord or if uh, John was just a spiritual uh, father to Gaius and others. But John said, when you, Gaius, walk in truth, when you obey the Scripture, it makes me happy. There's no greater joy than to hear that our children walk in truth. When you think of parents, you have children. And when your children are obedient, which is biblically, and they are walking in truth, and they are honoring the Lord with their life, and they are living in the truth, as a parent, that makes you happy. When they're not walking in truth, it makes you sad. I have no greater joy than that my children walk in truth. Our pastor is on the way or maybe there now at the conference and not with us. But you want to make your pastor happy as a church member? Walk in truth. You, you want him to grieve and, and to pray and anguish over you? Then, then do your own thing. Disobey God. Live your own life. Commit those sins. It will grieve your pastor. He loves you. But when you walk in truth, you bring happiness to your pastor. You bring happiness to those who are concerned for you. So when you think about walking in truth, it might make you happy, but I'm thinking about walking in truth produces happiness in the life of others. Church members are delighted when God's people walk in truth and living for the Lord. Walk in truth. And so he talks about walking in truth produces uh, not only healthiness, but it produces happiness, living out the truth. You have it in you, now live out the truth. The third quality, that, uh, which is really the core of the book, is uh, when you live out truth, it produces hospitality. You think of, John, you know, what's the big deal about that, you know? Uh, living out the truth, when you live in the truth and you're walking in the truth, the rubber meets the road. It develops into very practical qualities of godliness in our everyday life. You see, in the early church, as we mentioned, John would send some Bible teachers, we might call them today evangelists, missionaries, Bible teachers that travel among us, and that was true in the early church. Uh, they were sent by the apostle to give explanation of the scripture because they didn't have, for example, they didn't have Third John at this time. He's writing it, inspired by God. And so these, uh, these Bible teachers would uh, come to these churches. The scripture reminds us they didn't take money from the unsaved Gentiles because they didn't want to be accused, oh, you're just in this for our money. So they refused to take any money. They would, they would only receive money and help from the Christians. And so if a Bible teacher came to your town, to your church, various one would put them in their house and feed them and encourage them. And as long as they stay there a week or two weeks, and then if they were to leave your church and go to another church, the custom of the Bible time is that they would uh, fix a little lunch for you in a bag or a little basket, and they would give it to you, but they would then walk with you, you on the way to the next city. They, they would literally walk with you and talk with you and encourage you and, and maybe even loan you their animals. Next time you're back in, you can bring the donkey in. They would do everything they can for these Bible teachers, walking along with them as they journey on the way, and maybe halfway there, they would say goodbye and go back home. So there was a lot of walking. And uh, John is saying to Gaius, you did well by showing hospitality to these people. And so he commends them there, as we read in uh, verse. He said, these, um, these people, you've, you've shown hospitality toward the brethren. It's good to have people that you can show hospitality to that you know, and we do that in our church. 
you invite each other out to, to eat and what have you. And then it says that you also showed hospitality towards strangers. And these aren't people are unsaved. We don't know who they are. They just happen to be walking down the road. No, these are Bible teachers that you don't, you've never met yet. They are missionaries. They're Bible evangelists. They're coming to your church to minister to you, to help you as a church. You don't know who they are. They're strangers. But you accommodated them. You provided for them. You showed hospitality toward them. And they testify that you showed your love. And they talk about that before the church. And uh, John the elder is commending them for doing that because that's so important to provide material needs for these people that have been sent from God. He goes on to say, because they went forth for his name's sake, verse 7, taking nothing for the Gentiles. You say, well, today is a different day. We have motels, uh, we have restaurants, uh, Bible teachers, missionaries are all supported. Uh, I know I need to walk in truth and probably should be more hospitable than I should, but we live in a different age. Why should we be hospitable? Well, look at verse 8, if for no other reason than verse 8. Wherefore, we ought to receive such, be hospitable towards such, that we may become fellow workers for the truth. When you walk in truth and you show hospitality toward those that come to minister to us like evangelists or Bible teachers, whatever they might be, you literally become a partner with them. Yeah, they over there in a certain part of the world and They've been over there for four or five years ministering the word and building a church and leading people to Christ and you back here. You say, but it's such a little thing. It's not a little thing with God when missionaries come and Bible teachers and you show hospitality because you are partnering with them. You, you're reaping their benefits. You become a partner. You are a fellow working with them. So be involved, we who are back home in the church, and greet these people and show hospitality toward them and uh, get the blessings of being a worker for the Lord. Now that's really the heart of the, of the text, but we want to go on to verse 9, and we come to this man by the name of Diotrephes. Diotrephes was not walking in truth, okay? There's truth over there. He was in the church, probably a member of the church. Uh, John said, I wrote to the church, and Diotrephes, who loved to have the preeminence, he was a man that wanted to be kingpin. He wanted to be first in the church. He wanted everything, all decisions to come through him to be approved. Diotrephes. In my lifetime, I've known a few Diotrephes in churches. I can't share with you now because it would take me an hour just to go through it. You wouldn't believe it when I, when I finished. I remember two Diotrephes in a church in New York City. I mean, they were mega Diotrephes. You know, sometimes it's not only lay people that try to run the church. Sometimes it's a pastor that try to run the church. I remember meeting some Diotrephes that are pastors, and today I think of a couple of churches that don't even exist today because they wanted to have the preeminence. And they not only want to have the preeminence, you say, how can a guy like Diotrephes, who did not receive John, that's one thing, and then all the people, if anybody, if you received one of, these, um, uh, one of these Bible teachers and had him in your home, he forbids you to do that. And if you did it, he kicks you out of the church. He puts you out of the church. He excommunicates you. You say, how can, how can such a guy do that? Well, it happens all the time. And uh, like John said, look, it, when I come, I'm going to call to mind his deeds, which he does. Pratting against us. The word pratting has the idea of a, of a bubble that is blown up and it's, it's empty. He, he, he lies. He slanders John. He, he twists the truth. He's not walking in truth. When you walk in truth, my fourth word is you create harmony. Diotrephes created disharmony. When you and I walk in truth, we want to be obedient. We want to be submissive. We want to be loving. We want to be forgiving and we practice all that, we live that out in our life, there will be harmony in the church. There will be harmony in the church. You know, I was talking to my wife about what I was going to say after some of my walks. She said, you know, that's a good principle for the home as well. When you think about a husband and wife, 
if both are walking in truth, there's going to be harmony. She wouldn't come up, and there wouldn't be much harmony at home, but if I got Shirley to come up with me, and we walk arm in arm down this pathway, there would be harmony. When people walk together in the truth, it will produce harmony in the home and in our church. Diotrephes did not walk in truth, and therefore he caused all kinds of disharmony in the church, and he tried to kick people out of the church, and he was successful in doing that. You know, I just say as a, as a member of this church, as one of the pastors, you know, make sure we deal with diotrephes in the churches before they become so powerful. How can a man like that become so powerful? Well, he might have had a lot of money. Sometimes other church members will listen. He might have been, um, he might have had a position in the, in the community that everybody respected. He might have been very persuasive, very talkative, very domineering, and it's hard sometimes to deal with the diatophy in the church. But if we aren't all walking in truth, all it takes is one diatophy in any church to cause all kinds of disharmony. But when we walk in truth, you walk in truth, I walk in truth, 500 people are walking in truth, 1,000 people are walking in truth, we will have harmony. It produces harmony because we are walking in the principles of of the Word of God. Well, we go to verses 11 and 12, and John writes, I like John, when we went to uh, seminary and began translating the, the New Testament, we didn't start with the book of Romans or the book of Galatians to translate. Paul was a very scholarly person, and sometimes one sentence is go on for eight or ten verses. And so our Greek teacher always started us in the book of John, third John, first John. John was a godly man, but he writes pretty basic. He was a fisherman. He knew the law. He knew the Lord. He loved the Lord. He walked in truth. He wants all of his people to walk in truth. But John is sort of a guy that is black and white, yes or no. And he says there in verse 11, Beloved, do not imitate, do not mimic, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. And then he goes on to say, very basically, he who does good is of God. If you walk in truth and you're obeying truth, you are a Christian. You are of God. And he goes on to say, he who does evil, you walk in evil, you're not walking in truth, you're doing your own thing, you haven't seen God. You're not saved. Now that's how John says it. If you're a Christian and you love the Lord, you'll be walking the straight and narrow way. If you're not a Christian, you're not going to walk the straight and narrow way. Now, there was a man in the church by the name of Demetrius. Verse 10, verse 12, it says, He has a good testimony from all. Isn't it wonderful? If you and I walk in truth and we live our life out in the church, outside the church, but we, we, we stay within the why we love the truth, we live the truth, you and I will have a testimony, a good testimony that we are godly. Now, are any of us perfect? No, do I even need to say that? <laughs> we often say, well, I'm not perfect. Well, we all know that. None of us are perfect. None of us are going to walk in truth 100% of the time, all the time, because we have an evil nature. Some of us won't even be able to walk 99% of the time. But if we habitually, John has taught, if we practice habitually, all right, let's say 80% of the time we are walking in truth, honoring the Lord. We never get mad. We never argue. You know, we walk in truth 80% of the time. You know, consistently, habitually, we will have a testimony. Now, unsaved people, people that haven't seen God, whether they realize it or not, they could be walking in truth for a while, but probably 80% of the time they aren't walking in truth. If they aren't walking in truth consistently, not judging, it's just evaluating, you can say, that guy can't be a Christian. He's not walking in truth. He said, Craig, that's judging people. No, it's, it's looking at Scripture. John says, if you love God and you imitate what is good, you live in court of truth, you are of God. You are a Christian. 
if you're not walking in truth consistently and you're over here walking your own way, you haven't seen God. You haven't come to God. So it's important that we walk in truth. Walking in truth produces holiness. Now you say, I don't know about that word, holiness. Uh, our pastor has been preaching on holiness now for several weeks on the Sermon on the Mount. The title of his series is called Real Radical Righteousness. Now if you are going to practice real radical righteousness, you are going to be holy, even if you don't like that word. You know, if we are going to obey the truth more than obeying the laws of the land that says we have to recognize same sir. I can't recognize it. You say, well, I'm, you're going to be called a bigot. They can call you what you want. We must walk in truth, not only in that area, but every... I, I'm praying that God will make us stronger, more public in our conviction, more loving. Now, we need to keep in mind that those who practice that evil same sex are people that Christ died for and that we need to witness to and we need to bring to Christ and we need to love them, but we don't condone their sin. We don't agree with that lifestyle. Why? Because walking in truth, God's Word says it otherwise. You ever want to know what God thinks about the decision on Friday? Read Romans chapter 1. Shirley and I read that uh, for our own help and encouragement, uh, the response to God. We need to walk in truth. When you walk in truth, I don't know if you're going to have a halo around your head, but God said you will be holy. You are, you are, you are practicing radical, real, righteous living, which is radical to the unsaved world, which is the extreme right, whatever you want to call it. I call it walking in truth. Commit yourself as a believer to walk in truth. Now, John comes to the, the end of his paper, so to speak. Remember, he's writing on papyrus. He doesn't have too much more to go. He didn't want to use another sheet of paper. So he said, look, I have, I have many other things to write to you, but I'm going to do that later when I come face to face. Uh, that's like uh, Pastor Odo or any pastor when they get through the sermon. I really have more to say, but time is gone, so I'll have to wait till next week to, to say it. John wasn't through, but uh, he concludes his letter. Very practical letter. But I hope you catch the theme of walking, walking, walking in truth, walking in the Word of God and living it out, not just in your mind, but in your life. He closes, he said, I hope to see you shortly. And he probably is going to make his journey there uh, to wherever this church might be, probably in Asia Minor, what would be modern-day Turkey today. He said, I hope to see you shortly, and we shall speak face to face. I like the closing words. He said, our friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. Uh, these are Christian friends that probably over in Ephesus, and they got Christian friends that are over in Turkey area, and they are to send greeting back and forth. I isn't it wonderful? We might not know each other, you know, from other, like we have in today, the College Heights Baptist Church, a meeting in our chapel. Uh, they are a different church. They are brothers in Christ. You probably don't even recognize any of them, but they are friends, people that you don't even know. Uh, I'm often drawn closer to people when they get saved than my own brother and sister and relatives that I, I grew up with that aren't Christians because we don't have the same thing in common. And uh, it's wonderful when you walk in truth, the number of friends we, we, we need Christians to be friends toward one another as we go forward for this day. It's not going to be easy, I have a feeling, as Christians. I hope that we all determine to walk in truth and, and to live for God and to take a strong stand. And I don't care what the world says. I am going to obey the truth, and I'm going to walk it out of my life, and I'm going to let everybody know I'm going to be a Demetrius. I'm going to be a radical, righteous, living person for the glory of God. That's what walking in truth would mean. Now, maybe I'm getting the cart ahead of the horse because some of you need to come to the truth. Usually when Pastor Odo ends his sermon, he comes down, stands here in front of the communion table and invite people to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. We're, we're going to give an invitation, but I'm not going to stand here. I want you to imagine before you can walk in truth, you need to come to the truth. Jesus says, I am the way 
the truth, and the life. No man come to, to the Father but by me. That's what the Word of God said. That's truth. And we invite you to come to the truth. I'm going to step aside. Pastor Parker is going to lead us in an invitation. And if you are not a Christian and you want to come to the truth so you can walk in the truth, you need to come to the Lord Jesus Christ first. You need to come to the truth. He is the truth and the life. So as we give an invitation and as we think about what the condition of your heart, maybe some of you need to have the courage if we're going to take a stand for God out there in the world and say, I'm a Christian, I don't believe in these things, I'm going to live for God, you need to have courage enough to come to the truth, come to the Lord Jesus Christ. So think about that as we have our closing hymn and uh, pretend that uh, Jesus Christ is here with open arms, he inviting you to come to the truth. And uh, if, if you need to do that, by all means do it as we close our service to come to the truth. Would you take your hymn book, please, and turn to hymn number 571? 571, as you respond.